the hydro group. And we are a little bit different than the other ones, and we have two parts for you. The second part's more fun. The first part is you know, a little bit more tedious. So we're going to try and do the first part fast. The first part is just listing the questions that you would like answered in the two webinars. The first one being on bridging the state commands, and that's webinar number one. Webinar number two is um, changing the spill in the Columbia River dams. So we have a list of questions that we have sort of started with that we have heard from task force members before today. Then the other two groups have added and refined a lot, a lot of these. So we'll just try and run through these really quickly. Um, and the question for you is are there other questions or nuances that you want to make sure are addressed in those webinars? And um, so Steve, I'll just go through really quickly and then you can get, jump into the nuances, okay? So the first one is you know, um, what are the benefits um, to Chinook? And we talked a lot about how that's measured in different things, but it's like, um, what would breaching the dam, what would benefits to the Chinook be? Um, conversely, what would the impacts to hatchery production, and would there be a net um, net benefit to the river system or not? Other? What question, Susan, on whether the benefits of Chinook abundance is that juvenile and adults? Well, here's the, the, the question was, what are the response variables to the Chinook abundance? And the answer is, the abundance was the question asked in the prior because we've heard various metrics in terms of small to adult uh, reach survival, or beta detail rate survival, but what is the actual adult abundance increases expected as a result of reaching the four lower snake river dams was the question prior. We talked a lot about authority, um, who has authority to what it came up to from both states, Washington and Idaho, what authorities there are. They have and a lot of federal authority both both for breaching and for decommissioning, right? So that nuance. What is the role, it started out, what is the role of BPA, but they asked us to, you know, they really want to know the authorities and roles of all the federal agencies that are involved in this decision. Um, what are the impacts to transportation, irrigation, that was expanded, um, it, you know, here is energy and, and um, carbon, so really what are all of the impacts to the existing uses if the dams are breached? Um, what are the implications of the court rulings that are going on? And what is the current um, NEPA process and timeline? Um, and again, a lot of the other groups added a lot of nuance to those, but we want to hear from you. So, um, Paul. Oh. So, um, I think those look reasonable, but five and six, I question a little bit because from an ORCA focus, in the connection with the vessel stuff, like if we were going to get too social focused, like we would say, let's see what the impacts on the rail tour boats are and all this stuff. And I think we should focus on, you know, the orchids and not the like, impacts to those things, but that's a problem. Any other questions, observations, thoughts? I just had one question. I know that we always talk about the Snake River feeding the uh, orchids, but one of the questions I have is, it has fish passing. You know, it, it has, from what I've read up on, it has pretty good fish passing. What about the dams that have zero fish passing? We don't ever seem to talk about that. Like Grand Coulee has none. Look at all the habitat behind it that could be used. So that same question came up in the, the last work group. Uh, for those who don't know, there are a series of hydropower facilities located just upstream of the lower Snake River dams within the state of Washington that are, that are in the state of Idaho that have zero fish passage. And as you noted, Grand Coulee, and just downstream of Grand Coulee is Chief Joe. And there are a series of other dams, both hydro and non-hydro, all across the Pacific sort of states, uh, Pacific Northwest, uh, that don't have fish passage. And so, in one of these uh, subsequent conversations we're gonna have here, is about identifying those dams, and identifying those that are uh, socially acceptable, or how we want to define that for, for removal, for fish passage to benefit Chinook, and therefore some resident killer whale. But yeah, that conversation has been brought up. What about the other dams that have no fish passage, and why the focus on the lower snake? The other question that came up um, in the other group was, um, why the snake and not Skagen or, yeah, you know, other river systems. So just looking at all of the river systems in the state, the state State, and if you're going to start reaching the like, dams, that was the question they wanted to answer. Why, why the snake? So that will be what I think that's on yeah. from the one to the other group. Uh, I've got Ron's comment. 
You got one. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, so, what are the benefits to the orchids? And um, is this on? Yeah. I can not. Oh. Okay. <laughs> trying to tell me something? <laughs> <laughs> it won't work. <laughs> so, um, my specific question is, NOAA Fisheries published a tech memo when they looked into this question of taking down the Snake River dams, specifically for its impact on the amount of salmon that are coming out of that system and are available to the orcas. And what they found is that the loss of the wild fish is compensated for by the hatcheries to the extent that pound for pound, there is a sufficient volume of Chinook salmon coming out of that system. So I would like to hear about that tech memo. If, if there is no net loss of Chinook salmon because of the amount of the hatchery offset to the wild fish, then we are, all other issues aside, we are supposed to be focused on the orcas and in their best interest. I, I, am not, I, I don't see how this fits. Yeah, that, that's a great question, a great observation. That is one of the nuances that lies behind the summary version. When you fold, see the full version of that question, it asks exactly that. If wild should not quote equal or exceed the current abundance of hatchery plus wild, then what hatchery production would need to be funded in my room in order to compensate the lost number of fish that were previously produced as mitigation for the dams? In other words, would there be a net loss of Chinook available due to the summer and a killer whale without the hatcheries that are currently mitigating the dams? That's the question. And that's a legitimate question, and we'll find an, an, an honest answer to that question. That's the intent of the webinar. We're glad you brought that up. Thank you. Other, other questions? Go ahead, John. Yeah, so um, if we were to remove those dams, um, how long would it take before we saw uh, a significant increase, if indeed we would see an increase, in in uh, Chinook available to southern resident killer whales. And the reason I ask that question is that we just removed two dams on the Elwha, and as I understand it, uh, river production has gone down, at least temporarily, because of sediment in the system and less spawning habitat and less survival. So, I mean, what, have, have we done an analysis of that? And, and uh, that, that might be helpful in determining um, how urgent this is or how soon we expect to see it for so tiny, what you want to know, tiny, that's a good question. So the, the prior two questions are exactly what are the expanded on versions. I should have just gone ahead and read the whole questions as opposed to the summary. Because the first one was, that you guys wouldn't know this, is it's the, the tiny question. If the uh, lower snake river dams were breached, what are the projected, or, uh, projected benefits and how long will it take for those benefits to be realized? So great question, John, and we'll get that answer. Other questions? This is just on the breach. Just on the breach, the next uh, the next topic is on spill. Oh, the second. Yeah. Oh. This, second. So, so the other things on breach. As a, as a task force member, I'd like to know, is there anybody that could prioritize for the southern residents, Fraser River, Puget Sound, or Columbia River? And when I've asked this in the pre work group, the answer's been all are important. But if somebody knew, I mean, I think it's the Columbia River just because the current fish coming out of the Columbia compared to its historical abundance, it's the biggest delta compared to Puget Sound or Fraser. So that makes me think that the Columbia River should be the priority. Is there somebody else that could agree or disagree with that? Help me understand if the Columbia River is really the priority for the southern residents. I think that's a good question, and that sort of is the widest snake. You know, when you look at these others, and we can add the Fraser River. Well, well, let's just try and get that that answer. Is that I broke it down. I got it. Well, I was just going to point out that the answers to a lot of these questions were in the uh, Army Corps of Engineers Appendix D here on removal of the Snake River dams which they spent $33 million on studies. And uh, they, they have many of these answers. I'm, I, as a task force member, I, I have a lot of questions, and I'm confused about 
the way to get them answered. Well, the, the, the specific thing for right now is what do you want answered in that webinar? Do you have additional questions to the ones here that you On the like Snake answer? River, it, uh, you know, I'm a whale guy. I, I love the whales and I want to keep food for them. But it seems to me that there's a huge economic issue here too that we're losing money on. So, so, it, so we should have an economic analysis along with the, the fish analysis. And uh, actually my first recommendation right now to the governor would be pick up the phone and call the commanding general of the Army Corps of Engineers and ask some very pointed questions that we're asking here. Yep. He can give the answer. And we're going to get more into those what we should do about this after we have the webinar. So this is really just what questions do you want to answer before we have that conversation. So um, with respect to benefits of breaching, would that produce different life history patterns of Chinook that may have existed at one time in the Columbia? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, just wanted to. Yeah, we can certainly add the question, but I suspect the answer will be yes. I don't know what we can answer. All right, are we ready to move on to the spell oh, webinar? To clarify that, so the question was, would a breaching of the four lower snake river dams result in additional life history of, of existing stocks or perhaps new stocks? Look at genetics and diversity. Run timing, June hogs come to mind. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, moving on to spells. We want to get to those other recommendations. Actually, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, still. So, go ahead. Um, I'd like to know from in reading some of the information for today. Um, reading some of the information for today on the spills and, and dam removal. I it, maybe I didn't read close enough. But anyway, what I would like to answer is <coughs> increasing the spill. Why does it cost so much? What, what's involved in in these costs and it, you know, to me, it seems like letting more water over the dam doesn't cost a lot. You just need somebody to run the lever. But um, anyway, that was not clear to me because it, it gave a big breakdown in costs, kind of caught one one alternative versus another, in the increased cost. And I think that would be really good to know why. Yeah, better understanding the cost. So just a background on this. You can explain this better than I can, but the dissolved, it's, it's getting that balance between increasing the gas and you what you said. Right, so, so increased gas, total dissolved gas is in the, suspended in the water column, can be harmful to young fish or adult fish as well. It can burn and, and cause other ailments, if you will. Uh, the more the water is spilled and plunges, the more total dissolved gas gets entrained and therefore the most, more likely injury to fish. And there's a trade off. At some point, 115, 120, 125% total dissolved gas, there becomes a trade-off between increased or decreased survival due to injury versus increased survival by getting in the ocean faster. And so there's a relationship in there somewhere. And then, and then um, the notion with the cost, and what we've been told on that is water that is spilled is not generating hydropower, which is in more generating revenue, which then comes as an economic cost, just to get quickly at the prior question. Yeah, I, I get the uh, the uh, issue on, on the um, gas thing. I, I think there needs to be some science. I think it gets to an excusatory thing for the hydro folks that because it, it depends on what's downstream, and, and you know the super saturated gases usually go into the atmosphere rather quickly. It just depends. It, it's kind of a complex thing, but I think we have to be careful about that being an excuse not to do spills. I, I think it's a dangerous thing to do oversimplification. That's exactly what I'm going to Yeah, yeah. So again, the, the basic question people want is how do you balance those two things and getting better information so that you can decide whether it should be the Oregon number or some other number and what do you want, what specific number do you want to recommend? So other questions beyond that that you want to ask? Uh, well, I would ask about consecutive spills when you have a series of dams, the residual debilitation of the young fish on the way down. Uh, and then I would also ask, uh, you know, let's look at the true economics of spill. You know, I mean, we say it's uh, foregone power. On the other hand, if the power sold at a loss, 
Is it of economic laws? And I was thinking along the similar lines and trade-offs between the 120 versus the 125. What does that mean in terms of gas bubble trauma? Um, I know that there's a lot of information there, but I think synthesizing that and pulling it into the webinar would be really helpful. Other questions? Did you have Comment. So, uh, Members of the trade group have told me that really support this, that it will bring mature fish back in two years. It's one of the fastest, most immediate action things we can do. True or false? Good question. We'll add that to the list. True. So the other um, thing to say is if you have um, speakers, or experts that you know on this, did that. Uh, to, those names to Steve. Yes, to please like, let me know if you have a recommendation in terms of an expert who would like to speak on uh, total dissolved gas and spill, and we will organize a webinar. Hopefully, I can't guarantee the next two weeks, but that's our goal, is sooner than later. And then I will bounce those names off the governor's office for a final list of the presenters that will join the webinar. All the task force members, and others, I presume, will receive the announcement of the, of the webinar. You should probably take it away from there before I misspeak about process. Yeah, he, he, said, he said nothing wrong. <laughs> That's true. So yeah, we'll get the, the details on the webinar and I'm assuming that we're going to clean up this whole list and send out a, uh, to task force members the final list of questions so you'll have one more chance to see that before the webinar, know what to expect. And you know, they may not be able to answer all of your questions, but at least the position to have those different. So the next thing we're going to do is actually look at some um, potential recommendations. The first one is on page three of your discussion guide, which is um, talking about removing um, non-lower Snake River dams and locations that most benefit uh, Chinook Passage. And the working group came up with some options um, for the uh, Task force consideration. The other two breakout groups have sort of coalesced around them, but before I tell you what they did, I'll let you guys sort of think about it on your own. The options from the working group, I'll just read real quickly, were support funding for the currently agreed to and supported dam removal projects. The second one was develop a list of priority projects for dam removal and the list of information on the dams that have already been removed and what their benefits to um, salmon have been. The third is um, to halt dam projects that aim to address flooding on the Chehalis River. Let's see, and you can read, there's a little bit more about that there. And then the fourth was to prioritize removal of dams from um, the American whitewater list, such as, and it lists them, um, and other groups have talked about you know, there's other ways of listing, but the, the point there is really to have a prioritized list uh, to work from. So before I tell you what the other groups did. I'm just curious if what you guys, uh, your reaction to these are. Um, so as it relates to the uh, Chehalis Basin, um, I would remind folks that, that we have a pretty public process already underway for the Chehalis Basin, and um, this could be presupposing that public process or um, not allowing that public process to move forward, so um, I'm uncomfortable having that here. Other thoughts? Any? And in terms of appropriate roles for that, I wonder um, if it also makes sense, because I think it's going into a scoping phase, but the, the right process is through there, but requesting uh, Chinook look in that existing process might be a way for the task force. So if there aren't others, do you want me to tell you what some of the other groups landed on, on this? That would be helpful. Do you want to jump in first? Is this about the other dams in general or the shales yeah. in general? No, the, the, this whole. Yeah, jump. So, the, so there, there's at least one project that is underway that falls under the other dam category that we would really like the task force to come out and support of, and that's uh, the Middle Fork Dam on the Nooksack River, where, which um, 
does have 15 miles of habitat, but we're not exactly sure uh, how much of that could be utilized directly by Chinook, but um, it's a project that ranked very high on the Puget Sound um, Acquisition and Restoration Program, highest ranked major project. Uh, it, it's gonna come before the legislature this year, and so I would, I would really like to see the task force support that action and to, to ask the legislature to fully fund that. It's a, it's a specific action we could take right away. It would help Chinook. And secondarily, um, uh, the Electron Dam and the Mud Mountain Dam on Puyallup River are both Spring Chinook, would affect Spring Chinook populations, and, and we should be looking at those as well. Perfect. Those are noted in the discussion guide. And to follow what Jacques was just saying, the two additional recommendations that we heard was what you just said here, as well as to ask the Department of Fish and Wildlife in, in conjunction with its partners to inventory, assess, and prioritize others that are not on the short list uh, for implementation in the upcoming time, and then to reach out to the seven salmon recovery regional uh, board directors and ask them if they've got a list of projects that are supported, community supported for removal that would benefit Chinook and have a direct connection to Southern River and Killer Well. Because we know there are small dams and other fish passage bears that may not have that strong of a benefit, so we need to parse out those that are Chinook and those that have a direct connect. So, so, so the first part of what, just to summarize what Steve said, is when you look at the, the first three under D that are listed, the Middle Fork of the Nooks, that the Pilchuck and the Nelson Dam, that's saying move with those right away, fund those, fund those removals right away, prioritize the others in the way that Steve just said it, and then on the Shehalas, they said, let's not do a year one recommendation on that, but let's get more information on the linkages to um, Chinook and the benefit um, to the orcas and find out if there's, if there's a linkage there that the task force should be looking at. Does that make sense to all? Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, it's part of the scoping process, yeah. And, so I think that's a good example. The Nooksack is, I think it's at the top of the PSAR list, and I don't know if the Pilchuck uh, project is above or below like current funding lines, but I think that's where, yes, there are a few pro uh, programs already that can link those, essentially, but we still don't have a really strong statewide or even ecosystem-wide analysis that's looking at all of the barriers for Chinook. Um, and I know that that's kind of hinted at here in, in different ways, but I think that really makes sense that we need to do as much as we can in apples to apples comparison based on available information. And yes, there will be holes, but there's a few different lists out there, but they've, and they've been cobbled together from public information, but there's no good compilation that really looks at all of them, including the snake river dams, but the whole system that the orcas are depending on. So to me, that's um, that should be a really strong work task force recommendation is we need to make that happen and also should be expedited if it's existing information you know, we should be able to pull that together quickly in a, in a matter of a few months. And that's so specific fish passage, ecosystem analysis of fish, fish passage barriers. Exactly. Correct. And, and Chinook in particular, and, and to the extent that we can look at the other uh, salmon species that the orcas prey on seasonally, we can look at that as well. But it just feels like there needs to be this really deep dive into condition Chinook. Did, yeah, did you mean a full ecosystem analysis or just the run of the, the what would get opened up? What I'm getting at is there's there's certainly a need in Washington State and the Washington State boundaries, but because the ecosystem that serves the needs of uh, orcas extends beyond our state boundaries, that's what I'm talking that about ecosystem wide. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, with well, a strong emphasis clearly because we have more direct control over Washington State, but. Um, we need to get that done to the extent we can also look at our, our neighbors and, and barriers to good good habitat, we should have that. Yeah, so maybe a friendly amendment to that for you to consider, Mindy, is we start with the Washington assessment to begin with because the scale and scope of what you're suggesting, to me, it seems un, unmanageable in the first year. So let's first year get our Washington State information in line. As you probably all know, there's a list of about 40,000 identified known fish passage barriers across the state of Washington. The question is, it's, there's a, only a fraction of that perhaps meets the criteria that would benefit, you know, direct benefit to two of us. That's the assessment that we need to conduct to get a better handle on that number. So anything else on um, 
anything else on the other dams? We have one more to go through. So we have a couple other things to do. So if not, we're going to move to page five, um, which is talking about expediting the visa process. And the working group came up with the three options. Um, Requesting the governor send a letter to the Army Corps requesting that NEPA be expedited. Requesting that the NEPA process and the related biological opinion fully consider the impacts on the, um, what is that, Federal Columbia River power system on the um, killer whales. And then the third one is oppose any additional extension of time to complete the NEPA review. Um, so, We've had some interesting discussions on this in the other groups, starting with this is really easy, but probably not very effective. But since it's easy, let's do it. And then five minutes later, they decided, you know, this is really not worth the time to do it. So, and that's what the second group thought too. But what do you guys think? Are any of these worth keeping on the list? Why is breaching the Lower Snake River dams included under this expedited NEPA process? Um, okay, so we sort of agrees to take that off the list. So then the last thing that we wanted to do is in your packets, you should have a list of the, the prey working group recommendations that had potential, um, that had broad degree of support. You guys have that? I don't know if anybody they have a copy of this. I'm sorry, Susan. It says Prey Working Group. Prey, yeah. It says Prey Working Group Potential Actions with Broad Task Force Support yeah. from the Survey. It's just a single sheet. It's just a single sheet. And it was added to your, it was, it was put together last time and added to your package. And for those of you in the public, we're going to get this posted to the website as soon as we can. We'll just, yeah. Sure. I'd like to ask the question that that gentleman asked. Thank you. Yeah. Can you restate it? Um, why is breaching the Lower Snake River dams uh, on the expedited need for process? It's under G. Category B and then subcategory B. Sure sounds like you're trying to not have the governor ask for the breaching of the dams at all if this whole thing gets struck through. Okay. So those are standalone uh, the conversations here. This one is about expediting NEPA on the Clutter River operations. Now this is a Clutter River system-wide. It's 14 hydropower facilities owned by multiple state or federal agencies spanning multiple states and into British Columbia. That's what the NEPA is covering right now is all 14 FCRPS facilities, one of, or four of which those are lower SNCC. And so it's embedded in the notion of if we can expedite that overall Clutter River NEPA process and address increased spill at the same time, those are embedded but the breaching it still remains a separate independent item, although it is embedded in this. Do you think the task force could ask the governor to expedite the breaching of the snow lower snake or dams under the current 2002 EIS Alternative 4? I'm putting down under snake for the webinar to address the NEPA process. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So on the webinar, they'll get um, added. Added questions about the, the snake river. Thank you. Okay, so we have this potential list of potential actions, but hopefully you can share it, not everyone has it. These are the actions that in the survey that we sent you received broad support. The broad support is over 80% said they should be a yes to be included or an absolute yes. And um, we recognize that until you see the full package, you don't know which ones want to you want to be really prioritized for year one. But we're proposing that we continue to work on these and include them in the draft list of recommendations. And we just want to make sure that you're okay with um, these and don't have any you have any concerns or questions about any of these. Maybe. So under the two hatchery 
uh, recommendations here that seem to receive broad uh, support from the task force. We need to make sure that that is tied to increases in habitat, uh, where habitat is a limiting factor, flooding them with more hatchery fish just won't, won't accomplish what we need to do. So that is a kind of a crossover action. Um, so a lot of the habitat work we're not talking about today, that also had very strong support, great, but these two need to be intertwined. They're hand in glove, that's exactly right. That's the intent of the language at the end, so thank you, Mitty, great catch. Other um, thoughts on these, Dave? When I read uh, under A, increase, increase capture production and fill up facilities that most benefit SRPWs, not sure we know the answer to what the facilities are yet because um, my understanding is they show up in the Salish Sea clearly under the peanut heads they tend to fatten up when they're up here so to me that suggests they're not getting the fish somewhere else but nobody has really said where that somewhere else is yet so I'm not sure they set a priority. I think that's the same question I asked earlier for 10 minutes ago. In looking at this and thinking about how we move through um, um, hatchery production and wild fish protection over the last one or more decades, um, I guess I'm interested in seeing an adjustment in the emphasis, and that is. Um, increasing hatchery production at facilities that most benefit southern resident killer whales and pair this with investments in habitat protection and restoration be effective in order to meet wild fish conservation and the ESA. I, um, my experience has been that the habitat protection and restoration is so difficult, it's the end of a sentence and we put so much emphasis on hatchery and wild fish and wild fish, um, if there's better habitat, both of them will do fine. And so I'm, I would ask for an adjustment. Good point. And did you get that? I did. I don't have a point there. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, that phrase? Uh, I would just hope that uh, we could get more funding to monitor our uh, uh, bait fish populations, herring, salmon, and so forth, because if we're dumping millions more hatchery fish out here, uh, we could very easily end up with a lot of really skinny salmon, and uh, our, our prey stock is already pretty shaky as it stands out in the islands, and uh, we just we need to have people watching that if we're uh, putting a lot more predators on the ground. So a couple of hatchery increases in monitoring the fish, fish conditions, fish size, that sort of thing. Yeah, I was a little unsure what is meant by hatchery B, I will see increased size and age of return. Yeah. So um, there, there's some thought that we might be able to uh, manage hatchery pro practices to um, increase the, the age of return and size of return of Chinook. Um, not guaranteeing it, but, but so we should be looking at that. Is there something we can do in terms of our hatchery practices, perhaps retaining fish a little bit longer, um, but not as long as we would for a a yearling or a um, slack mail program to see if we can change the, adjust the population to return later. Right now it seems that our hatchery fish are returning fairly early. Three and four year olds instead of four, five, six year olds. Yeah, um, that was, oh, to deal with that question because I've done a lot of stuff. I don't think you can necessarily do that without messing up with the, uh, ethical and legal regulations on hatchery, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it would get into sort of this Atlantic salmon kind of thing, but, um, but, but anyway, that's something to look 
think that. But, but what I was going to bring up is I think the transparency of the uh, emergency action that agencies are doing, as long as people know that this is like a train that's left the station on, you know, WFW's already, they're taking eggs and things are happening. So I think, I think we'd like to get more updates on, on what's actually going on that separate action list because it's, there's a whole bunch of stuff already <laughs> already moving. So and, and you know it's, it's it's just sort of making sure we know what's what's happening there versus what we're talking about for the task force. So are you saying you would like an update on those? Yeah, it, it, because the WFW's got the Chinook Hatchery production list. You know, there's all this stuff going on, and, and it's happening like it's happening. So I think it would help this group to know what they're doing versus what we're trying to talk about for next year or whatever. <laughs> Okay, any other thoughts on that? How about this, Mindy? No, no, all of it. I'm sorry, all of it. The great ones. I was going to ask about one that's missing from this short list today that looks like it also has support from the task force, and that's forage fish B, um, increasing forage fish population through harvest reductions. Um, and with a caveat, I don't know if there are tribal fisheries for, for uh, forage fish, um, but I've learned that there are literally hundreds of thousands of pounds of forage fish uh, being removed from at least the Puget Sound system. So I am curious why it's not on, I'm worried that this is the short list that will be considered, so, so it's just, not on here. So just a process thing for when that, that got, it's not on here because it was closer to 60, 65% or something to his numbers, but those are the ones that are on our list for breakout, for, so for task force discussion at the next meeting. Great, there are you. ones that had more to have support, so they also had, um, yeah, so it, they're, like, they're on all of theirs, there's more on hatchery harvest, it, well, it looks like there were two people who were probably no, but the rest were neutral, not sure, but also yeah, didn't. And, and, and we counted, like, the, the not sure people that had a lot of questions, we counted. They weren't in the probably yes, so they didn't end up with 80%. So I'd like to make sure we take some time to set up that discussion because I don't feel like the workers have had enough time really to dig in on that, and there's a lot of great information available, and if this is at the base of uh, salmon, which feed orcas, you know, we need to pull that together and bring it up to parity with what we know about the other species. We will talk about that at the next task force meeting. John? So, so maybe I just missed it. What was the, what was the criteria for making this a short list? 80%. Yeah, 80%, yeah, 80 either the definitely yes or yes. So if it was neutral, I'm not sure, yeah. So it doesn't mean that 20% or 40% whatever were opposed, it could have been that they just wanted even more information. And Mindy brought up a good point. I've heard what she said many, many times from people about, wait a minute, uh, the harvest of forage fish doesn't seem quite right. And it was based upon a lot of requests for late breaking information that didn't quite make it out in time and just the pace of the second. Thank you, Mindy. So anything else on those? Regarding the Snake River Dam reaching webinars, um, will those be open to the public? I don't know this. We don't know. Will the task force uh, members be allowed to recommend experts? So task you know, force, yeah. Task force members have been asked, and are willing. You, you are certainly can continue to provide names of experts that you would like to speak on the Snake River Dam Breach of webinar as well. We did receive quite a few of you did give names already. So, so yeah. So both on spill and the Snake River Dam webinars, if you have people you would like to hear from, I think would be good experts. Let's see. You know, so that's sort of what we had for this breakout group. We're always like way ahead of everybody else. Um, so you guys can take a little break and we will reconvene in plenary. Yeah. 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 So just to like wipe your appetite for the next task force meeting, we are going to talk about the things that came out of the, the three webinars, um, the Snake River Dam breaching, the spill, and potentially climate change ocean certification, if anything comes out of that, and the recommendations that needed more discussion on um, 
habitat hatchery, um, what's the other harvest, and forage fish. So we got a lot on our plate, and um, like Russ said, there's talk about extended catch and it's probably in a half a week next level. That's the October 18th. So you might think you said this to try and walk off the 17th as well, just in case that could be So, anything else? All right, thanks you guys. Jackie, can I make an observation? No. Well, what I want, what I want to point out is that I've watched in these three sessions on two occasions when First Nation tribal people tried to interject a question and was shut down. And my respect to the gentleman who asks his questions, but I just want us all to stay mindful of how culturally biased we still are. And I just wanted to point that out because it, it was hard to witness this gentleman as a white male getting the floor when we shut down two tribes people and said no in different sessions that they couldn't voice a question. So our, our, our cultural biases are still blinding us to the wisdom that we're sitting in. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.